Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Caliber. Today, we switch our focus to UK smaller company sector and tackle a few topics. What made 2022 so difficult? Will the sector bounce back in 2023? James Yardley joins Par Marge from TM Telworth UK Smaller Companies Fund to answer these questions and more in today's episode. Today, I'm joined by Paul Marriage, the fund manager for the TM Telworth UK Smaller Companies Fund. Paul, thank you very much for joining us today. Good to be here with you. Now, Paul, 2022, that was a tough year for smaller companies. I think you described it as pants in your December update. So why was it so bad? Um, I think um, pants was a good good way to describe a year when you know we lost investors 25%, as did pretty much every other small company's fund. That's uh, a big number to lose. Uh, and you know it hurts, frankly. I'm a major investor in the fund myself, and it hurts. Uh, so why was it a bad year? So, so small caps were just really out of favour last year. And why were they out of favour? Because, frankly, they're a risk uh, on asset and a risk off year. So if you think about last year, unfortunately, dominated by Ukraine. Uh, and when Ukraine kicked off, one of the assets that people don't want to own, they're high risk assets. They're things like high growth assets and small caps due to their liquidity, the high growth nature of them are generally deemed to be high-risk assets. So, so definitely Ukraine was a major factor in making the sector unattractive. And I think the UK element probably unhelpful as well as people began to fret a bit about the UK economy, a bit of political turmoil, and all the other things that happened in, in 22 just made small caps a really easy sell for people. We particularly noticed that um, at, at the end of Q3, beginning of Q4, where it felt like people had come back from a long summer holiday, Maybe some people coming back to the office for the first time, advisors and wealth managers, and they really didn't want to know UK assets. They definitely wanted to know small caps. So that was a particular sell period. Actually, when we got through that period, small caps you know, started to rally again, looked a bit more attractive. So the year end gave us a bit more optimism for this year. Yeah, so what happened in October to, to kick off this rebound? Was it just that everything got so, a bit cheaper? You know, a little bit like land that gets saturated and can't take any more water. You know, small caps just got saturated with bad news. Uh, and yeah. people began to say, well, this can't get any worse. So I think you were looking through. Well, one of the factors last year in smaller companies was that it took quite a while for small companies' earnings to kind of catch down. One of the things you notice in stock markets is larger caps with more efficient uh, research, more analysts generally get forecasts and market uh, forecasts for company profits down earlier, a little bit more efficiently. Perhaps one of the attractions of small cap is that inefficiency, the fact that you can perhaps get something very right and be ahead of the market on something. But equally, the small caps were a little bit behind the market on that last year. So it meant that it was a bit of a downgrade cycle. And I think people felt that come mid-October, can the downgrades be any worse? And also, we're pricing in a pretty bad scenario here. So maybe if the scenario is just a little bit less bad than we think, maybe energy prices peak a bit earlier, maybe inflation. Um, you know, and by then, energy prices were falling probably by then as well. So a few things in October, and it was just like peak bad news, uh, actually, it's not so bad. So a very small rally from quite a big low. Uh, so it was that was welcome way to year the end, and that kind of carried on until the year end, a little bit into twenty three as well. Yeah, and I think one of the things which really hurt last year, I guess, is is not just that the small caps did badly, but actually the FTSE one hundred held up pretty well for yeah. you know, the first time in a while. Yeah. So obviously, over the long term, you know, looking over twenty years, small caps have done a lot better. Than, than the large caps. Yeah, so absolutely. can this year be, be a year of catch-up? I mean, do you think the worst is in for small caps? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of so how small caps troughed um, and why was the FTSE 100 so good? So the FTSE 100 was good because it's the National Indies Index had lots of energy. Energy was clearly good. They're very dominant in that mining. So, you know, the FTSE 100 is a representative of the UK economy, not really. International businesses in a couple of the sectors that were most popular last year as defensive places to go or places that benefited from the economic situation last year. The first year was good. That's a, yeah, it was a good index to be in last year. Small cap had all the things you didn't want, uh, as I've just alluded to, liquidity, exposure to, you know, to the real economy, um, you know, weak consumer, struggles in the supply chain still working out for corporates. Um, so there were lots of reasons why small and mid cap really underperformed large cap. In the long term, as you allude to, small caps generally outperform larger companies because small caps in the life cycle of the business, you're buying them at their fastest point of growth. Um, and therefore, you've got the chance to make multiple times your money as a company is kind of growing up. When it matures, it's more difficult to get those big returns. But last year was definitely a year when mature larger companies with 
in, in certain sectors, and those sectors that are quite big in the FTSE 100, um, it, it, it was it was the right place to be. And it's the nature of being in an index that can outperform significantly over a long period of time. You're going to have years where it just doesn't work, and last year was definitely one of them. Sure, sure. And what are your thoughts on uh, M and A and IPOs? Um, I mean, both fell off a bit last year. I mean, yeah, it did. I mean, M and A's is a bit of a comeback for them. Yeah, it, you know, it, there's, there's been a bit uh, this month or well, two bits this month already. One for Devro, which makes sausage skins, amongst other things, uh, yeah. and one for Dignity, which is a funeral director. Um, so, you know, that might suggest that M and A is going to pick up in 23. I think if we look back a bit. What you know, why was there less M and A in 22 than perhaps we might have expected? We expected lots of M&A because valuations are low, sterling was weak, overseas buyers found the UK market attractive. Historically, when that combination has been there, political uncertainty as well, that's generally attracted buyers. I think last year there was probably a bit more nervousness about funding because of, you know the rise in long-term rates probably made people who use debt to fund M&A um, much more cautious. If you look at some of the more attractive M&A that did happen last year, generally trade buyers, so EMIS, which is not we. I mean, software was bought by a US trade buyer. Those kind of transactions are much more common. Devro, in fact, is a trade buyer. Uh, I think Dignity, the fuel director, is sort of infrastructure, private equity. So um, I think that one of the reasons we, the, probably the big reason we had less m a was continued uncertainty about how things are going to pan out, given Ukraine, but also just the higher cost of funding. Um, I think, you know, if we see a little bit more clarity in cost of funding, I think people are probably, probably, would look through a situation like, like Ukraine. Historically, people have looked through some pretty bad news before in M&A. I think we'll see more trade buyers taking advantage of good companies on low valuations, of which we have plenty in the UK. I mean, do you bother to focus on the macro at all? I mean, it's obviously quite uh, difficult I'm to not talk about. Investor. I mean, you know, uh, anybody who's followed, uh, you know, Telworth funds or, or any of the other funds I've run in the past will, will you know, be aware that I'm very much a not a macro guy, not a, not a person to answer your inflation and interest rate questions. Macro has become a big market driver in the last year, um, yeah. kind of unsurprisingly, uh, I, I think, you know, given global economic concerns. But no, I'm not a macro guy. I'm a bottom-up meat companies pick stocks guy, and that's delivered really good returns for investors over a long period of time, So, but not last year. I think it's worth just going back to IPOs. IPOs, you know, a good IPO market should be an IPO market, a market that generates good returns for investors. Uh, and introduces great new companies. If we talk about m a we lose companies in m a they, they are no longer listed, and we want new growth companies to join the market at IPO, and we haven't really seen any of those in 22. Um, I think we will see you know, a healthy IPO market is usually the sign of a, a good overall equity market. So I think there's plenty of companies that want to float. I don't think there's a lack of people who want to float. I think the bar is quite high in terms of, you know, Good quality long term businesses with good market positions and probably market caps in the kind of 200 million plus are going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a tough market, I think, for micro caps. Um, it's just as generally investors have, have moved away from the bottom end of the market. Um, but yeah, I guess need to come back, I think, for a healthy market. And you know, I'm hopeful they will. And are you getting a lot of ideas at the moment when you're you're doing that bottom up research? I mean, are yeah. you getting excited by some of these yeah, valuations? And yeah, I think we are uh, getting we, we've got plenty of ideas at the moment. And, and actually, one of the interesting things that happens in a tough year is you generally focus your portfolio a little bit more. You know, you, you really focus on the things you think are going to work. So we've got quite a tight portfolio at the moment, probably ten holdings less than we had at the beginning of twenty two. Um, and I, that, that gives nice competitive tension for the best portfolio. So we've always got four or five stocks on the bench that are kind of trying to fight their way in. Uh, and clearly, we're trying to remove the weakest links. So no shortage of ideas. I mean, we've seen, probably already seen this year, uh, at least a dozen companies. January is quite quiet for the company. I, I've been seeing a couple of companies last week. I'm seeing another company tomorrow. So I'm doing a lot of visits, going out and seeing companies on their own turf, which I think is a, a really helpful thing to do. It's a good time of the year to do it. So maybe now, if we just dive into into your portfolio a bit, um, I mean, one of your top two holdings, well, yeah, one of your top holdings, I think, is Stellarad, which makes radiators. I mean, is anyone using them as we all try to reduce our energy bills? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about radiators is as you switch from perhaps a a gas or an oil driven central heating system to perhaps air source heat pumps and things. The amount of hot stuff that they produce is lower, so you need to distribute it more around your house to get the same effect. I'm clearly not a plumber or a physicist, I haven't explained that brilliantly, but that should be a positive driver for 
needing radiators. So you might need more radiator space in the same size room if you're going to some of those more um, eco-friendly, less fossil fuel-based heating systems uh, like air source heat pump, ground source heat pump, solar, et cetera. So that, that's a positive driver. Um, I think the fact that you're not using a radiator as much is probably at the margin, not that much of a concern for Stellarad. But I think this is a business that's currently valued on six times earnings with a 5% yield. So no one's expecting great things. The concerns about Stellarad will be mainly around new built housing. Um, the concerns around the general kind of housing sector, um, a property market slowdown, less new built housing, therefore less new radios going in. So Stellarad are in both things. They sell into new built housing. They sell into you fixing your radiator. So this is a really important point. You know, if your radiator is broken now, you're going to get it fixed, yeah, because you need the heat uh, and you don't want an inefficient radiator. So the retrofit market, builders most is probably quite good. That new house build market might be more, more difficult. The longer term trend for radiators remains pretty positive. Starrad is a you know, sort of market leader in the UK, uh, leading position in Europe as well. Uh, so, so it's one of those companies that we quite like for its P3M product market margin management type differentiation. It's also extremely cheap, so it's a bit of a value opportunity as well. So IPO from 21, um, and the company's actually done really well so far. It's not really missed numbers in a really horrible market. It's just a bit lost, but pretty tight shareholder base. Um, so yeah, high hopes for Stellar. I think it's a high quality business, well managed, um, but yeah, in the maelstrom of kind of small company bad, bad news and noise, it's probably not in a good part of the kind of Venn diagram. Yeah, and IG Design Group, another one. Yes, uh, IG is a stock we've we've had a long time. But IG is an interesting company. It uh, it originally these guys do wrapping paper, or did I? Imagine? Yeah, that's right. International Greetings was the old stock market name for it. If you go back, uh, um, probably a decade or so now. Uh, and International Greetings was a business that originally came out of uh, incentives to develop new industries in post coal mining areas. Uh, so it's one of its main factories is on top of a. Uh, an old coal mine in Wales. Um, so that's a bit of an aside, but uh, it, it is the UK's leading manufacturer of wrapping paper, gift paper, gift um, ribbons, tags, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Christmas crackers as well. Uh, so it manufactures those in the UK and in other locations around the world, sells them globally. Uh, so a fair amount of some of the more giftware stuff would come out of China and go into the US. Um, in the UK, a lot of that's kind of vertical integration from UK manufacture into UK supermarkets. So that full range of kind of shiny, sparkly stuff uh, that you generally use uh, on occasions like Christmas. Christmas, obviously, pretty important, but also birthdays. I think one of the interesting trends we saw last year was that while people were very worried about the consumer and consumer behaviour, generally people spent on Christmas. And also, if you're spending maybe less on a present, you're probably still going to wrap it nicely. You want that impact of a nice present. Um, so they seem to have fared reasonably well through Christmas. Now, this is a company that had some severe supply chain issues to go back 18 months and management change. Yeah. Uh, it was really hit by freight costs and making some of the wrong things in the wrong places and some demand hiccups. So it went from a bit of a hero company to a bit of a zero company in a very short space of time. Uh, new management team came in. Uh, we actually uh, really like the new CEO. We know him. Um, from one of our previous investments where he did a great job, also in a turnaround and an eventual sale. So with IG, I think we've got a really interesting scenario where some of the headwinds they have have gone away, like freight costs, and the management team have gone from crisis time, they're worried about survival of the company and the balance sheet, to being more front foot, to growing potential acquisitions again. Again, a really, really lowly valued share, but global positioning, pretty attractive, and a little bit different to most of the other things you might find in the portfolio. So... Yeah, I think IG is probably back on the front foot. It's got plenty of scope for share price recovery. It's what it deserves its place in the top half of the portfolio. Great. Well, that's been a great update, um, Paul. Thank you very much for that. The TN Telworth UK Smaller Companies Fund is a pure smaller companies portfolio run by two very experienced and highly regarded managers. It focuses on smaller companies avoiding micro caps and mid cap stocks. And as Paul explained today, meeting company management is integral to the investment process. To learn more about the TN Telworth Smaller Companies Fund, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. Mm -hmm.